just wanted to take the opportunity to touch base with you as, as we do on an annual basis now and um, just hear what's on your minds, make sure that, um, you know, the things that I'm supporting in the legislature reflect your priorities and uh, just, just chat. Well, I wrote you recently about thank you very much for the climate bill and all you did plus Adam plus, you, you know, the entire legislature and uh, I don't know how long it'll take Governor Baker to respond, but I haven't heard of any yet. But yeah, we're we're hoping he'll he'll turn it around a little faster than than this last time. Um, but we'll see. And I think we're definitely uh, prepared to do some veto overrides if necessary. <laughs> good, good. <laughs> we're getting used to doing those veto overrides with the governor, uh, so. Uh, I, I those feel to me like losses for him and i don't know why he would want losses he could talk up yeah. the climate bill and act like it was all his idea yeah he would get credit for it yeah and you know when we did the budget overrides you know we spent literally days um doing because we have to do each one individually when we do those line items and uh i think it was three or four days that it took to override each and one of each and every one of those vetoes so What else is going on in Conway? Anything I should know about? Well, massive across the board dissatisfaction with the vaccine rollout. Yeah. Um, and, and I, you know, I, I know that that's not your fault, Natalie. Um, but um, We're trying. We're trying to push <laughs> no, the administration um, you know, to do but, better. But the, the thing about it is, you know, we're heading into town meeting season. And one of the fundamental things that we're always asking people to do is to believe in the concept of government as a source of solutions. And um, and as competent enough to do that, and uh, to, to you know, and so this, when people have these just uniformly terrible experiences getting their vaccine appointment, I mean, you know, you, you have senior citizens talking of you know having all night parties because at one a.m. and four a.m. there's new appointments that come out, and if you don't get them in the first minute, you can't. And to actually hear like old people talking about like trying to stay up all night so that they can hopefully, and then, you know, how they have to have a grandkid there to push the button because they only have a second to make the, it's just awful. Yeah. And, yeah. Um, you, you know, and, the, you know, so. No, um, I, I wholeheartedly agree with you. It's one of the things that I've certainly heard most from constituents about over the last couple, you know, first it was testing. Uh, now it's vaccine distribution. And, you know, we're really lucky that we as a delegation, um, have worked really closely together to be able to push back on the Baker administration on a number of different points. You know, the fact that originally you could only sign up on a website uh, is, is a really difficult thing for folks in Western Massachusetts who might not have access to the internet. It's a difficult thing for an older generation who might not be tech savvy. Um, we were then able to get the 211 number in place, but then even <laughs> then uh, the website crashed. Uh, you know, they've, the vaccines were taken away from our local hospitals and redirected to these mass fax sites. Um, and finally, we have a pre-registration system in place, for, but it's only available for the max vaccination site, which is in Springfield, which doesn't help anybody. Uh, we know that our local public health system is prepared to deliver these vaccines. Uh, the Franklin Regional Council of Governments has been doing everything that they can, given the fact that the Baker administration continues to change the goalposts and um, limits the vaccine supplies that's coming into the county. So we'll keep pushing. Um, yeah, I have to say both Senator Hines and Senator Comerford have been active on two uh, committees that have really been looking at these COVID impacts and have really been holding the governor's feet to the fire in terms of holding him accountable for some of these um, well, this problematic rollout. Also that so many, you know, almost half of our vaccine appointments are going to people not in Franklin County, many of them in yeah. Eastern Massachusetts who are more than willing to drive out here to get a shot. But uh, there's a lot of them and not many of us and we don't get much in the way of vaccine. 
Yeah, the delegation just wrote, a, uh, actually it wasn't the delegation, this was a, a building-wide letter, uh, 54 legislators signed on to a letter uh, asking that we get more vaccines distributed to those, the regional distribution centers like Franklin Regional Council of Governments. And one of the things that we've seen recently is uh, that they do have to set aside only 25% for local residents and the rest have to be open to everybody. Um, so we're definitely trying to uh, bolster our our regional distribution centers and make sure that they are supported to um, at, at every chance that we get. But I hear your frustration. I've heard from a number of constituents. I've tried to help as many individuals as I can get connected with the right website or or the right appointment, and uh, it's been it's really hard to hear the stories of folks who have hit refresh on their computer screens for hours at a time trying to get an appointment. Uh, Natalie, where does the 25% come from? It's a directive from the Baker administration that the regional distribution sites have to, uh, you can only set aside that 25% for local residents. One of my friends got an appointment for his wife at a CVS mm -hmm. and he went through the registration process and it, then at the end it said, oh, there's no second shot available. And so they canceled his fir her first shot. Uh, and, uh, yeah, it's, it, it's really been, it's been horrific for people. And um, I just think we could have done better. And, and I think Tom mentioned it to you, but, but then there are the robots that are using a lot of the, um, you know, just continuously pinging the search engines, looking yeah. for free, for available appointments, and then notifying whoever the robots are being written by of these appointments. Um, and that's easily preventable. And I don't know why we're not doing it. Yeah. Well, I, yeah. I also wonder the extent to which people are signing up for vaccines who aren't actually eligible. Um, my husband was, so he so he did get vaccinated, but he was surprised that when he went, um, that they didn't ask for any, um, you know, I mean, they're, they're, he didn't need to provide any proof that, that he was actually in one of the eligible categories. So I just wonder about the, the extent to which, I mean, if it's this bad now, <laughs> when everyone actually is eligible, I mean, I can only yeah. imagine how much yeah. crazier it's going to get. Yeah, and I think this, the most recent, um, you know, the legislature did create this oversight panel and it just had its second hearing yesterday uh, to really shine a light on some of these issues to ensure when we get to the general population that they are addressed because you know, it's been a very, uh, I think the governor referred to it as a lumpy and bumpy rollout. And uh, that's, I think that's a, that's an understatement. We need to make sure that the, when we get to a, a wider swath of people that these, these lumps and bumps have been, um, have been ironed out. On a positive note, uh, 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 from everything I have heard, including my experience, the vaccination sites themselves are being really well yeah. run. Our local ones like, yes. you know, uh, um, at Channing Beat, uh, or, I mean, I went to the UMass Center. It was yep. great. Yeah, I, I, the, the way that the volunteers have stepped up uh, to run these sites has really been extraordinary. And, you know, I've been told that it, people are, when people get, the, and you may have experienced this, Bob, when you got your shot, people and, and seen it, that people get very emotional uh, because changes your life you're able to interact with your family and your grandkids in, in ways that you haven't been able to do for a year and so the fulfillment that people are getting at volunteering at these sites is really something and i'm getting my second shot tomorrow so oh good i'm, I'm glad i'm looking forward to it i'm glad yeah. bob the, the whole mood in the schools has, has just dramatically lifted it's like um you know it's, it's really really neat to see but the, mm -hmm. the sad part, you know, to, to me that there are very few things of government where we ask every single person to interact with. And this, unfortunately, is one of them. And the experiences with are just like uniformly terrible getting their appointment. Not like some people terrible, like everybody terrible. And that's going to have, you know, th this is like, you know, 
climate change. You know, if you can't, if you can't, if we can't vaccinate people, how can we do a big lift like climate change? Um, yeah. and, and it's just that's and people aren't going to say that, but that's going to be the kind of, you know, n- now it's just like another layer of obstacles to the big things that you want government to be able to do. Just, you know, because this was the chance to prove that you can do it. Yeah. You can't. Um, Everyone universally compares it to the Hunger Games, you know, competing yeah. with each yeah. other ruthlessly, you know, feeling like you are victorious if you manage to score yeah. one. And- yeah. Yeah, we've been, it's the Hunger Games or Lord of the Flies is what yeah. I've, I've yeah. been comparing it to because uh, it is, it's, it's been really, it's been really hard for folks. There's no doubt about it. Well, I just like to say that one other area of the government that we're all pretty much universally required to interact with is the RMV. And that's mm-hmm. something that I've had people express to me is the fact that we that the RMV in Greenfield is still closed and that you have to make an appointment yeah. in Springfield, which which presents a, a pretty big hardship for people. Yeah, we will be meeting with um, with the acting secretary. Uh, I'm trying to arrange a meeting with him and the local planning agencies and the RTAs just to make sure that the delegation and, and he have an opportunity to to touch base. And it's certainly something that I can bring up and check on in terms of when the RMB will be reopening. We had to fight like hell to get those senior hours. You know, we, it's like it's every single thing um, ends up being a fight. And that's why I'm so glad that our delegation works so well together. But it shouldn't be that way. <laughs> And it's one of the reasons why I've been pushing so hard for this Office of Rural Policy uh, so that we do have somebody full time really looking out for rural communities and how legislation, how policies, procedures might impact rural communities. Um, But, yeah, Eric, I'm happy to bring that up with with the secretary when, when I see him and have that meeting. Especially when the RMV in Greenfield is the most pleasant RMV I have ever been to. Uh, the workers there, the mood of the people who are there, you know, it's, it's as much a joy as possible to go yeah. there. Yeah. And, and then not to be able to go there. Yeah. Yeah. The trip to spring, you know, it's funny. I think you know, people from the 495 area see Springfield just being a hop, skip and a jump down the highway, but it's really, it's a hard, it's a hard place to get to. It's a hard place to navigate. Um, and without public transportation, it, it's a real, it's a real issue. Uh, so it, it really is not a viable option, generally speaking, for the RMV, for vaccines, for any of these things that, that are being offered to the region. So I also want to talk about just some other funding thing, you know, my thing is that it would be great to just have more predictability in government about future revenue and future expenses. And that every year it just sort of, you know, we don't have a dependable situation where we can predict um, a whole lot of things that are going on. There's the, you know, we live in, in fear of when the, the, com- the computer in the sky spits out their algorithm and tells us what our minimum school contribution is. And, you know, all, all these things that are um, impossible to really get insight into what it's going to be in the future you know and 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 yet that determines our school budget more than anything and Mm -hmm. um and our school budget is almost two-thirds of our town budget right so so you know front frontiers you know our our assessment of frontier two years ago conways went up 15 percent because of the minimum uh, contribution calculation this year as you know sunderland's is going up 15 percent um because of the minimum contribution calculation, which I know that there was reforms done to it last year or the year before. The Student it was, Opportunity Act. Yeah, and, and that the idea, it was supposed to have smoothed it out just a little bit, and it was supposed to be one more percentage point geared towards student population rather than town incomes or something. But um, I, I, it still struck I know Sunderland was surprised by it. And there still is just a sense that, um, you know, it, it could be any town's turn in the barrel at any given time with no predictability. So that's just one thing that it'd be great to have meaningful reform in that particular calculation mm-hmm. so, that, so, that, um, so that it's just more predictable for the future. For Just one year out would be great. Yeah. Um, um, 
and, on a, and, on and a related I know, I, note, I, oh, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, and I know whenever I talk about that at all, it's almost cruel and unusual because it's such a boring thing. But um, but it, it's a hugely important number that nobody talks about because it's just so complicated. Nobody can understand it. And, um, yeah. so yes, Tom. Uh, uh, on a related note, um, I know there was a commission on uh, technical schools at the state level. And one of the um, one of the issues we've had is uh, transportation costs for out of district students, and that having to be borne by the town. Um, I had understood that that was one of the things that might be addressed by the commission, but uh, I think they just disappeared into thin air. I haven't heard a thing about that, and I'm wondering whether you have, and and what the chances are that we can get some reform on on uh, mandating out of district education mm -hmm. and transportation. So that, that's a great question, Tom. And uh, I'm glad John Gould has just popped on. Hi, John, how are you? I'm good. Hi, hey, John. Hey, John. Hey, how you doing, everyone? You hopped on right when we started talking about school transportation. So <laughs> I know Adam, Adam did, um, was on the school transportation commission study group, uh, which put out its report what, two months ago now, mm -hmm. is it, John? Yeah, about two months ago. A um, more. Was it a little more than that? Does, does, does that the, include technical the school transportation? Uh, does does that include that it, technical I think school? It, I think that it looked at all school transportation options across the entire Commonwealth. I, I looked at it when it first came out, Tom, and I'd have to be honest with you, I'd have to take a look at it again, but I can certainly there, send you that link. Yeah. There, there was some talk i think of punting the technical school issue to the technical school commission that had been formed but john as i was just saying as you as, just before you got on um i think that commission vanished into thin air I, I haven't heard anything about any recommendations that came out of it and uh here the um the uh amount that it takes to send somebody even just down to northampton is is pretty substantial um, so we're, we're, uh, we're wondering whether or not there can be some reform and requirements for out of district, uh, payments, uh, both tuition and, uh, but especially transportation. Yeah. Oh, John, do you want to go ahead? I'll look into that. Um, I haven't, I, I read it initially as well. Um, and I will talk to, um, uh, fellow, um, Team Heinz members and see what um, movement there is on on the um, issues that were raised in the in the study's findings. Yeah, I mean, it feels to Thank me you. a lot like regional transportation. You know, if it could be reimbursed at the rate of regional transportation. Well, it would... So it's it's somewhat ironic too that you know that for Conway, the kids that usually want to go down to Smith are the 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 ag kids, the 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 farming families' children that want to have participate in the farming in the family farm and that ends up actually costing the school more than any other possible educational choice the town more than any other educational choice any child could possibly make which sounds yeah, there, there's that in, in criminal justice and i know that the yeah. franklin county tech is considering an agricultural program uh but criminal justice is another one that takes some people away every once in a while like now it's good to know yeah, and Phil, to your original point, um, in terms of the budget process, last year was definitely a strange year because of COVID. Um, this year, with Ways and Means is moving forward on a on a normal schedule. Uh, you know what it looked like previously. We've started the Ways and Means hearings. Uh, I think maybe Friday we have our fifth one, and the goal is to to get back onto a, a regular schedule where we are the the house is taking up the budget in april the senate taking it up in may and going forward from there and then it, you know for the student opportunity pat act it did pass um it, it for a lot of our rural communities there there really wasn't a change uh adam has been incredibly uh, successful in getting the rural school aid uh, but we were able to get uh, a low and declining 
um, study commission into the Student Opportunity Act to begin to really dig deep on our schools across the Commonwealth that are experiencing low and declining enrollment, what that means for our communities, and you know what what we can look at going forward. It was one of the frustrating things I think for both Adam and I with the Student Opportunity Act was, you know, it had a very limited scope, and while the Student Opportunity Act was absolutely critically important for many, many students across the Commonwealth. Um, we need to take this extra step for our, for our rural communities that are experiencing this low and declining enrollment. I, I agree. Um, but thanks to the burgeoning population of, of Sunderland, the frontier really isn't, the enrollment is not really <laughs> going down. Um, but the, the, you know, the, the, the few th school things that, that really affect the budget that I think are like low hanging fruit. I don't know what, John, you, you missed the, the bit about the minimum uh, con school contribution, mm -hmm. the way that that's still calculated, the, the, the little tiny tinkering that was done with it. Really, we didn't see much effect of that on the ground this year. Um, you know, Sunderland was hit with, you know, Sunderland's assessment for, 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 for the school is going to be 15 percent this year. Um, Conway's two years ago was 15%. And these are sort of out of the blue thunderbolts that just devastate a town's finances. Um, and it's all because of that minimum contribution number, which still lacks any sort of predictability. Um, and so, you know, that's number one. Um, number two, you know, the, 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 the full funding for regional transportation, I, uh, that was just a, big loss when that wasn't included when it, um and and you know i i was at the meeting um natalie invited me um and and adam invited me to the 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 joint committee road show that was pre-pandemic in northampton the 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 hearing or the the discussion and alice Pish, Pish came out and she's and uh deerfield selectman um select board chair um uh, asked her about regional transportation and why, why, why we're not talking about full funding. And she said she was personally opposed to it, that it's a niche issue and her constituents will not support it. Even though the total annual price tag for the whole state was like 50 million, 40 to 50 million in most years. But for us, that's a, another huge yeah. element of predictability. And it's something that there's people in at town meeting every year that, you know, that, that see the fluctuation in annual reimbursement on this and remember that the whole reason we regionalized in the first place was the promise of 100% reimbursement in yeah. this, like the law says. And um, it, the worst thing was just three months after Alice Pish made those comments and then turned around and walked out of the room, by the way, because she had to leave early, um, the, the, the MMA gave her an award for being the state legislator of the year. And I tried to, I tried to convince the select board to quit the MMA. Um, uh, I couldn't get a vote on that. Um, couldn't get a, any other votes on that. Um, uh, but, you know, the, the, so I always thought that would just be sort of, that should be doable. Uh, I don't know. Um, yeah, we've been working in the legislature to get that funding up every single year. And then the last two years, it has been increased each year. Um, and certainly trying to get it up to 100%. I think right now we're at around 80. Uh, it was no, this, this year was good. This year was good. It, but, you know, next, you don't, you, this seems to be the other thing about it is that this comes, that number comes out long after the chapter 70 number. And it's sort of the, like one of the last things on the governor's desk that he can, um, you know, cut, cut the state budget with by, by just taking that line item out. It just seems that way. It's always the sort of, one of the last numbers that comes out mm. is that, but, um, and then for town fund, I thought, I yeah. thought the last thing I saw, you know, I may have been the governor's budget, but I remember reading something that was quite positive on, on regional school transportation, uh, percentage. Uh, so I, I feel like it's, it's, if the governor was proposing a higher amount, maybe that means good news, uh, for the for what reaches his desk this year, but I'll look into that too. We have the same kind of problem with Chapter ninety funding, uh, and I and it's always hard for me to know how this affects rural towns versus you know less rural towns. But our number of miles is 
very high. And this year, for the first time, we're going to we're looking to borrow money to do road work that we normally try to fund, you know, at least purchasing our asphalt with chapter 90 money and yeah. we can't afford it anymore. And we can't let our roads get too, too terrible. I mean, you know, that you stretch out how many years between redoing the roads and they get very bad. And so this is an important point too, that, that, you know, for, first of all, that, that, um, as the cost of road work has gone up, the cost of compensation has not. And what we can do with the amount of money just gets less and less every year. The, the cost of materials is skyrocketing. And um, the, you know, so, so as Bob said, as Bob said, this is the first year in Conway's history that we're going to be doing, going to be asking to do road work out of the operating budget, um, which is not sustainable. Um, and and actually, you know, actually we're borrowing. Well, yeah, right, right. Which is, yeah, and and and, and you know, it's it's one hundred and seventy thousand dollars to do one mile of road on the cheap. And you know that that, and and you know the 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 thing is we 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 applied for all the grant we applied for the grants the the various program that that exist for uh, small towns small rural towns to get extra whatever. And one of the criteria on that grant is how many um, fire and ambulance calls were not able to be completed because the, the rescue vehicles couldn't use that road, mm -hmm. which is when you think about it, that's an insane criteria that that you're that that if you want to be at the top of that list, you've got to let your road get bad enough that your ambulance can't get there to save the life of somebody living on that road. Yeah. And that's or how many accidents occurred due to the due to the condition of the road. Yeah. Right. And, and so we see our friends in Buckland doing that over the years with the, their portion of the Buckland Shelburne Falls Road, which actually should have a sign as you approach either direction saying, put on a kidney belt, you know, <laughs> because you get thrown around in your car like, I mean, it's just terrible. And what grant What grant application was that, MassWorks? Yes. Yeah. So, um, I hear you on the chapter 90 funding. I'm on the transportation committee. Again, we just had the uh, a hearing on those funds. Uh, I guess it was two weeks ago now. Uh, the governor is proposing the $200 million we recognize and have supported his in as recently as last session, a $300 million program. Uh, the MMA estimates what that we need about $687 million in that uh, for everybody to be able to do their projects. It was incredibly frustrating for me last year to, to be sitting uh, on the transportation committee with the secretary coming before the committee saying that uh, there was no need for additional chapter 90 money because towns weren't spending down what their, their annual appropriations and you know, me thinking to myself, of course, they're not spending down their annual appropriations. They have to set aside multiple years of funding to be able to do a single project. So one of the things that I'm, I'm, I've introduced a piece of legislation this session to, uh, to begin to look at unpaved roads and low volume roads, uh, because, you know, our towns are having to spend money to maintain our dirt roads. Uh, they're getting progressively worse with climate change. Uh, so if there's a way for us to begin to direct additional funding to our communities to address those, you know, those dirt roads, you might be able to redirect those funds to a different project. Uh, so Senator Hines and I are introduced, are trying to push that legislation forward to develop a commission that would begin to look at the costs of unpaved road maintenance and those low volume roads, we might be able to if we get enough information, I'm hopeful that we can make a case for additional Chapter 90 funding. It's, yes, it, that, it, that, it is that, a, that, a difficult problem with lots of different, different aspects to it, kind of like the schools, in that every town is different and it has a different road system and different needs. Yeah. Um, but I think yeah. a good benchmark would be would be cost sharing at half and half. Mm -hmm. So you figure out what a town needs through a statewide pavement management assessment. 
and then say, you know, the town will be expected to pay for half of it and the state would pay for half of it. For Conway, that would raise our um, that would raise our Chapter 90 assessment considerably. And it would it would it would end up being more than 300 million. As you pointed out, the MMA calculated about 680. So it would be about 340 million now. That that original advocacy number of 300 million was from several years ago. Yeah. And I know Jeff Beckwith came out with a chart where he showed that level funding was effectively a decrease over time, of course, because as Phil pointed out, material costs go up. Also, labor costs go up. So uh, um, uh, I, I think a, maybe a good policy would just be to you know split it between the state and the town. It wouldn't be that much of a change, and it would be a good benchmark so so towns would know, you know, that that's, you know, that they could expect um, that amount of money. Mm -hmm. And and in a, in a multi-year appropriation too, that would help. Right. Yes, yeah. multi-year appropriation would be great, and it'd certainly be something that I would support. And all at, of a high, at a higher to... level. <laughs> All of this relates to transportation in general. Uh, the, the RTA funding to all of Franklin County is a joke. Uh, and, and not just when I compare it to the MBTA funding in Boston, but, but it's, you, you know, the fact that we can't run our buses on, week, on the weekends. And, yeah. and, and, and we change the bus routes and we change things too quickly over trying to find something that works, but it, it really hurts people because they can't, they can't move their apartment when the bus routes change and then they can't get to work again. Right. Yeah, I introduced another piece of legislation this session to look at uh, RTA sustainability and support. Um, I'm the vice chair of the RTA caucus in the, on the house side and we're meeting tomorrow to talk about legislative priorities and the RTAs support for the RTAs will certainly be one of our top priorities. There seems to be a lot of support and Adam included mm -hmm. for the East West rail. And I, I, you know, personally, I'm not a fan. Uh, we just don't have the money to spend on East West rail if we can't spend it on RTAs or, um, you know, I, I, and I would rather we were putting it into your northern corridor. Yeah. Uh, I'd love to see Route 2 Rail. Which is cheap and and East West Rail. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think it's, it's really interesting that we have, a, right now, we have the opportunity to be looking at a rail network in Western Massachusetts in a way that we haven't before with the Knowledge Corridor, Route 2, the Berkshires, and East West Rail. So, um, it's, it's a really interesting and exciting time to be looking at transformative rail projects. And, uh, you know, I'll be interested to see what comes out of the federal government in terms of funding in, in the next couple of weeks, months. It would be great to have a loop. You know, as you say, mm -hmm. Route 2, then down to Springfield, then back to Worcester or Boston. Yeah. You know, and there's a new secretary of transportation. So we're, like I said, we have to sit down with him and talk with him a bit more about um, his priorities for, for rail and whether and making sure that he is supportive of the expansion of rail service in Western Massachusetts. I have just a, a different question that something you've been interested in, is that is hemp. You know, are, is there still a market for hemp for, for you know, a year or two ago? It was in the news and, you know, every football player, every old rock star, they were promoting, you know, CBD oil and, and hemp products. And I don't hear anything anymore. Did, was that a successful agricultural, you know, program? Uh, I think that the state could have done better in supporting farmers around hemp. Um, in some ways, the state and the federal government have been playing catch up with one another. Sorry, my kids are hopping in the car right now. So, hey. um, so right now, the state is in the process of trying to update some rules and regs around to have based on federal changes. Um, but I, it was very difficult for farmers 
to, to Has be hemp been added to any of the products that they wanted to use when they're not allowed to because the product doesn't list it? Uh, there was there were some changes on that in in the last. I'm sorry, the time is all blending together. Yeah. Uh, there were some changes that were recently made, <laughs> at least in the last year, that would have allowed them to do that. Um, and we're still trying to pass legislation that would allow farmers to grow hemp on APR land, which is something that they cannot do right now. Um, we were able to get it through the House last year. The Senate passed it in a different uh, vehicle, and we just couldn't get together on in terms of how to, to move that forward. So... That's certainly something that I'll be pushing for this session. Going from going from hemp just to cannabis. So <laughs> the I don't know. So Conway Conway did the um, bylaw changes to encourage family farmers <laughs> to to do, to, um, to grow cannabis commercially outdoors, um, the low impact in the environment, et cetera, et cetera. And something that you know one 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 farmer did apply for it, but then to he you know. The, the 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 state then now deciding to basically embargo or keep the finished product of those farms from entering the marketplace because it tested positive for soil microbes um, <laughs> is remarkable because um, that standard isn't really based on sci on real science and it's grown in the soil so it's going to have soil microbes and that's the whole idea of growing it in the soil um so like that, that the, the uh, um so so it's a real problem it's a real uh, vehicle to end it's a real uh, barrier to entry um uh for the family farmers that are thinking about it um knowing that there's no commercial possibility right now of selling what they end up doing so mm -hmm. um so that's a thing i, I that's an issue um, so. I hadn't heard that, John. Have you heard anything about that? No. Yeah, no. so we can look into that. Yeah, that's the thing. They, the there's only a couple of outdoor uh, uh, cultivations that this year in the state that, that that had a product. Ours, ours, I guess, isn't planning to till this fall. But um, but their product was not permitted entry into the marketplace, and it is sitting in guarded warehouses. Um, for months. And there's a so. similar issue um, that I've I've actually I, I talked extensively with David Lakeman when he was there, and also with Commissioner Shailene Title, uh, which is compliance with the National Organic Program for organic certification. Um, some states, Washington and California, have created workarounds. And something needs to be done um, so that Massachusetts farmers could be competitive in that market as well and, and get a market share um, uh, when, if and when uh, there's, there's federal legalization. And uh, you may or may not know, I used to work in, the, in organic policy for the Organic Trade Association, and um, I, it, it's pretty clear what needs to happen to move forward but um, somebody needs to pay attention to it if that's um, some something that the state wants to provide for its growers is is a, a clear pathway into that market um, once it's legalized on the federal level. So that's just a little long term bug in the year. Uh, if anybody wants to know about it, I'm happy to um, share the information I have. Tom, are you talking pest management for for cannabis specifically, or just organics generally? Uh, certification of the product and of manufactured um, cannabis products as well. Okay. Uh, so, so growing and manufacturing. Yeah, I know some of the farmers have been talking to us about pest management on cannabis because of the federal um, barriers. So. I know there's a piece of legislation to address that piece that's been introduced by, I think, Paul Mark. Yeah, that's uh, cer certainly a step forward. Um, there, there, there are structural changes uh, that, are, that will be necessary um, for, uh, for entering the, the certified organic market. 
Okay. Yeah, happy to talk more about that. Natalie, one of the things that's come up recently is about mosquito yeah, control. No, mm -hmm. And we're going to be asked whether whether we want to, you know, go along with whatever the state wants to do or if we want to present a plan ourselves. Do you know if there's anything happening in Franklin County in, in a general sense about mosquito control? Uh, in general, we, we, we sort of go along with what, what Deerfield wants to do. We might join them or not dear, join them and, and Caroline is, yeah. is sort of the, the person. You That's know. exactly who I was going to say you need to talk right. to is Caroline. Right, right. right. Uh, I mean, but it would be a big step for us to say we're going to come up with our own mosquito control plan. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I know she's been talking with us about that. And um, it's something I, we're trying to, I think she may have been working with Senator Comerford, uh, who represents Deerfield, on the possibility of securing some funds for mosquito districts. Uh, but I'm not sure. I have to be honest with you. I'm not sure where that's at. But we have about six weeks to to finish our application, I think. So yeah, that feels I'm fresh. happy to I'm happy to to circle back around with Carolyn if that would be helpful. That would be great. Okay. Yeah, you know, just I guess circling back to the school to to this school. The one other thing that um that that has really become apparent during this pandemic is the need for um, better funded behavioral and mental health uh, counseling services in in our schools. And right now, the way it's set up is that the towns pay for that. <laughs> um, and, and, and actually, Massachusetts is a minority of states that way. I'm, I'm told that um, that the majority of states in our country, the, it's it's funded through through the state or through some other method. I mean, not just basic chapter 70. This is what you get, you know, one of the people that's on your staff. And, um, you know, the, the it. There's a correlation too between our high suicide rate, you know, youth suicide rate, and the lack of of service counseling services available, and and um, you know, it, it it ties into our underinvestment in public health in general, or our non-investment in public health in general in this state, which is also um, quite scandalous, I think, and. Um, uh, you know, and it's what the chickens are coming home to roost with the vaccination efforts. That's all part of it. We just have never, it, you know, we don't have the public health infrastructure that we should. And our, our, re, our towns are poorer and sicker than they should be. Um, yeah, I think you're going to see a big push in the legislature this session on behavioral health, uh, specifically for children, given COVID. And you know, our children have been through a lot in the last year and will go through a lot as they re-enter school. Um, and so I think that, I know that Marjorie Decker has introduced a, a number of bills to address the behavioral health uh, crisis we think that's coming. Um, and then in this last session, we were able to pass the telehealth legislation that did allow for uh, to folks to access behavioral health services over the phone, which was an incredible success for many people and opened up services that you know, we've been struggling to find here in Western Massachusetts. And then, you know, I, and, I just want to mention one of, sure. one of the things that Senator Hines has been spending his time on recently is he, he was named the uh, chair of the reimagining Massachusetts after COVID committee. It's an ad hoc committee and he's, he and, and others are planning a, a six stop um, listening tour in the six um, parts of the state. And in each part of the state, there's gonna be a different theme uh, along with uh, issues of concern to that particular region. And so health, you know, healthcare will be one of the topics. Um, so, you know, I, I would imagine that that issue of, of um, mental health uh, coming out of the, or, you know, in, in the pandemic and coming out of the pandemic will be an important topic. Thank, thank you for raising that. Yeah. Have them come to Conway, one of those six places. Uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, I'm trying to think where the Western Mass one is. Is uh, I I don't know where it's going to be. All I know is that uh, uh, the, there is a Western Mass one, and um, I think the um, one of the focuses is uh, 
transportation and 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 uh, broadband. So, uh, you know, I'm not sure where that's going to be, though. I'm so glad he's on that committee that he's leading it. Uh, I think it'll be he'll do great things on it. Yeah. Coming up quickly, I think uh, you're trying to get in all of the sessions, all the six leg uh, listening sessions in before uh, June. Wow. You were saying, Phil? Um, what was I saying? I don't know. Yeah. Well, while you're thinking, um, yeah, you know, we were talking about legislation and so there is upcoming climate legislation that's important to a lot of people out here. Um, but you're taking the word biomass out of the APS and the RPS. And, and you were a great support for it last year. It didn't really go anywhere. But, uh, you know, there's going to be a lot of on heating and uh, on, on, you know, moving from electricity to, to heating and, and, and buildings and... Uh, uh, a lot of work to do. Uh, the only other piece has to do with Governor Baker's the regulation change that he's having the Department of Energy try to push through to basically remove the regulations that that govern burning wood and how clean it has to be burned. And uh, I expect that when the is it the Joint TUE Committee that has to get formed and and then he will resubmit them. Yeah, it's my understanding that that committee is is waiting on the Baker administration to resubmit. Senator Hines is on that committee now and, and he wrote uh, a letter to the chair uh, raising the issue of the um, biomass and also the um, the early ending of the SREC-1 program. So um, that's something that, that Senator Hines is very concerned about. And he, he was also just mentioning recently in, in another conversation that the biomass issue is really gaining a lot of momentum. And so um, hopefully that will uh, mean something. John, what, what is the, uh, what is the SREC program um, issue and how does that relate to the new SMART um, initiative? Well, it's it's just you know it's the program that preceded the smart thing, and and DOER submitted in most recently, and I think it was December, um, uh, new rules which would end the SREC program early, and um, and I I I can't quite remember it 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 um, I think. Uh, it, it could cut off like maybe a couple of years off of um, the payments that some solar producers uh, would have gotten. And so um, we've heard from, you know, people who have, you know, pretty large scale solar farms for their businesses um, saying that they made those investments expecting, uh, I think it was, 40 quarters or something of payments and um, so that they stand to lose you know, tens of thousands of dollars um, that they would have would have gotten or even more than that. Um, and so that's problematic for, for a number of reasons. And uh, so that's, that's um, those are the two big parts of the DOER rule changes, uh, the biomass and the SREC thing. Thank you. Okay. And this, and this is SREC 1, not SREC 2. Correct. Yeah. One of the other things that I wanted to talk about is that, you know, that the municipal aggregation of electricity services that's occurring through our small towns. And I don't really have any complaints about the services being rendered, but um, the, the, the precedent that it's setting in that the private companies that are allowed to you know, th that bid and, and do these contracts and, and operate these services in our behalf, um, they, they don't have to post any financial information or disclose what their profit is. And um, whereas every other company operating in the regulated utility sector does. Um, 
And so, I, you know, I, that's just my concern that this is going to all come back and haunt us someday when it's revealed that these companies are making gazillions of dollars. Um, and uh, so, so I, you know, I, the, the, the way that it's set up right now that allows us, the taxpayers and the you know people in government, you know, no visibility into their compensation structures, their whatever, just how much their money they're making on our behalf, you know, with our um regulated utility purchasing so i don't know that's it's it's kind of as we privatize more and more governmental services it's just important to keep transparency with everything and so i think this is a bad precedent that we've set up so this is phil's issue it's not necessarily all of our issues uh we've had say, our... bob you were quoted in the state house news weren't you <laughs> yeah uh, we, we did have our aggregation broker come in our aggregation broker makes it a, a tenth of a penny on the kilowatt hours that that conway buys it's not a lot of money uh it's a standard rate all of the sREC broke uh, all of the uh, aggregation brokers generally charge um and they're not getting wealthy on it, but but uh, Phil is you know upset that he they won't open their books up to him. No, because it's such a complicated market that there's many different revenue streams besides the obvious ones that are being disclosed to us or that are known, and um, for, for 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 the players within that market. So, um, yeah, you know, it's. You think there might be conflicts of interest? I don't know. We're not going to know. They don't have to disclose very much. So, um, what else was there? Oh, yeah. The um, so th there there are like you know we, as 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 a town we still try to do things um, on our own because and that's how it always feels like we are. Um, 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 and, and, you know, one of the things is we have an open space committee that's doing this South River restoration work and um, and, and they're going to be applying for more funding at town meeting this year. And they are very interested in having um, Natalie and, um, and and Adam come and do a tour of the work that's been done. And um, so that we can coordinate it and get, you know, an article written or something so that that committee has a better chance of getting funding because, you um, you know, those are always tough sells at town meeting. So, um, Love so, to see so work. yeah, yeah. So, so you can expect a phone call from the, from someone from the open space committee, probably Janet Shays. Um, okay. Um, asking, uh, it's trying to set up an appointment with, um, with you to, to do a tour of that. Okay. Well, it's really great that the state is starting to recognize what Hurricane Irene did uh, you know, to all of our towns, and, the and one of the things is bringing invasive species out of the state forest that that weren't being managed within the state forest, and washing them down all of our rivers. And, and so we we do have a, a fairly important river for turtle habitat that they are trying to do some work that they're funding some work on within the state forest. Um, and but but we're trying to you know, and do it ourselves for a lot of the other rivers in Conway. Okay. It's also, yeah. it's also a real, it's also a real good example of a successful state local funding partnership. Yeah. Um, and, 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 and FERCOG as well. So it's, that's how it's kind of supposed to work. Um, yeah, it's an MVP grant for oh, flood great. mitigation. Great. MVP program is incredible. And we were just successful in, in you know, getting, MVP to expand its program to include water and wastewater treatment infrastructure. So that was really good work for Franklin County. So now my I've big question, another, are we doing, oops, sorry, Bob, go ahead. Well, I have another call at four o'clock. So I'm I just do wondering, too. I just, we, and I I'm sure you do. And, and it's, we're getting there. So I want to make sure everybody can wrap it up quick. Uh, I was just wondering, are we having a festival of the hills? As far as I know. Okay. Looking forward to it yeah. also. Good. Yeah, we ha we have so precious few traditions. We have to uphold them. <laughs> at least the fun. At least the at least the fun ones. You know. It's one of the best. It's one of the best in Franklin <laughs> County. It really is. 
Yeah, we get John over every year, so that's <laughs> wonderful that he comes, still comes. Does he really? Yeah, and that's and you, you've probably seen the articles of Tom Riccardi, the, the 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 bird guy here in Conway that just released four beautiful owls. He, there was yes, a really wonderful that. article in the paper. He's a treasure for our town. Yeah, what's, and what's he's there every year. Anyway, I've, I've, what's happening with the rebuild of the church? Is that is that um, moving ahead? They're, they're moving ahead. You know, you know, they're. Uh, We've just had a lot of discussions with them about whether the town would help them or in how, how we might help them. And it's very difficult for us. We're not allowed to give them money and uh, we'll see where that goes. But, but they were very underinsured and they can't come close to building to, to, to putting up another building that's look gonna that's anything like the former building. Although that was actually so ugly it had its beauty all of its own. But um, but the the uh, you know that the, the what they're going to be able to build is going to be you know some modern brick thing or whatever and uh, you know and it's kind of sad but um the, the church was really important to conway many yeah. many events were held in their basement or upstairs in the church itself and we would love to have that come back and have the town use it uh the, there were a number of organizations that held their monthly meetings in the church and they were some of the most favored, well, you know, like AA meetings, you know, the most favored spot in Western Mass. Nice. Can I just take this opportunity to say thank you, Tom, while we have you. Thanks for everything. It's been really wonderful to work with you. And I just want to wish you all the best in your, your new endeavor. Well, thank you. I'm sorry I'm no longer going to be working for a town in your district, but I get to work with John still anyway. So. You do. You're here. So thank you very much. Thank, thank you, you all. Listening. It was good to see you. you. Everyone. Thank you for listening to my complaints. <laughs> it's good to see your faces. Nice to see you. Nice to see you, John. Nice to see you. Bye-bye. Yeah. Okay. Bye, everyone. Bye.